Hello and welcome to the second session of our do-it-yourself 3D printer design workshop here at SimScale. Before we actually to start to dive into the topic of our today's session, I would like to make sure that everybody can hear me loud and clearly. Therefore, please press the uh, uh, raise your hand button in the case you can hear me loud and clearly. Great, I see already some hands. Seems like everything is working fine. Uh, should for for some reasons your audio stream drop during this webinar, you can also use our toll-free audio service numbers. Therefore, you just have to dial one of those toll-free numbers and enter the access code 9628078378371 once you're asked. Great, then let's get started. And first of all, uh, I would like to announce a small change. Uh, due to high request, uh, we decided to switch the second and third topic of the webinar. So this week we will talk about cooling simulation and airflow simulation inside the 3D printer housing, and next week we will talk about vibrations. And as I mentioned, um, today we will talk about cooling, and therefore we will also talk about fluid flow simulation. And first of all, I would like to discuss some very quick fundamentals with you about uh, heat transfer, especially uh, different types of con convection. After that, I've prepared again a nice live demo where we will investigate and improve the design of this rewrap 3D printer. And finally, we will have time to discuss your homework and your questions. Before we start to discuss the fundamentals of cooling, I would like to know if everybody has some open questions regarding the current homework. As you know, uh, you have still two days to submit your homework and qualify for the free certification. And if you have questions related to the homework, please feel free to ask them right now and I will try to answer all of them. Um, as you know, you can basically ask us every question in the question box and my colleague Krishna and I will try to answer them as soon as possible during the session or latest at the end of the session during the Q&A. All right, then let's get started. And I think most of you already have some experience with 3D printing. And what you can see here is the image of the part which was printed on a RepRap 3D printer. And this image was just taken after the printing was finished. And if you take a look, um, you can see that um, the shape is looking a little bit weird at, at the boundaries. So here at the contact patch between um, the part we manufactured and this hot uh, this bed of the printer. You can see that here uh, the part is shrinked and uh, wrapped off from the surface of the 3D printer. And the result is that uh, the shape of this part is actually not representing what you wanted to print. And this is a very, very extreme case and usually wrapping will not have such a big negative impact on your print results. But, however, a big aim of 3D printers, especially when you use a uh, 3D printers based on the fused deposition, deposition molding, is to reduce this wrapping. And the question is, why is this wrapping happening? And therefore, you should take a look at the temperature profile. And um, here I just sketch two kind of temperature profile. It's more like a qualitative uh, representation of the profile. So the profile might not look exactly like here. But basically, I think these two graphs are uh, showing the big difference. The reason why we have this wrapping is that uh, the temperature within the material changes massively during the printing. Uh, once the material is uh, printed at that moment, it's quite hot. As you know uh, from last session, it's heated up in the extruder and leaves the extruder with around 190 degrees Celsius. And then it touches um, the older layers, the previous layers, and starts to become solid again. And if the solidification takes place too quick, the temperature difference in that direction, so in the direction away from um, the print bed will change too fast, too rapidly, and then the part will start to bend. And the only way to avoid this kind of wrapping and bending 
is to manipulate the temperature profile and to make sure the temperature is not dropping as fast, especially um, if it's away from the um, extruder. And there are different uh, opportunities. But basically, what most printers do is using a heated 3D printer bed, which means you have inside this, this plate small wires, which are then heated up. And through this additional heat, uh, the temperature will rise and become more stable, and that will reduce wrapping. And as I mentioned, one idea or one co approach is to use a heated bed. Uh, something else you can also do and combine with a heated bed is using a fan, which tries to um, homogenize more the air temperature around the extruder and around the part you're printing right now. And this is actually what we will try to simulate today. So what we will do today is to take a, a closed 3D printer, which is a closed housing, and try to simulate the temperature distribution inside this printer during the printing process. And like last week, uh, therefore, we have to talk about heat transfer again. And as you uh, remember, last week we focused on conduction, which is the heat transfer uh, within solid or between solid bodies. And we also talked about the other two mechanisms of heat transfer, like radiation and convection. And this week we will talk mainly about convection. And convection was defined as heat transfer, which comes with fluid transfer of mass, or a transfer of fluid. And one example I gave you back then was that you have this heated plate and you have the airflow coming from the left side and then the air heats up in the near of this hot surface, the density drops and it rises and transports heat together with the mass flow of the air. And right now I think it's time to take a quicker, deeper look, not a quicker, but a deeper look at convection. There are basically two convection phenomena, two kinds of convection. Uh, we are talking about. And first of all, on the left side, you see what we call forced convection. And basically, forced already says the difference. Uh, if you have forced convection, it means that the net mass flux, so the movement of the media, in our case air or any other fluid which is transporting the heat, is uh, forced by an external energy source. For example, if you have uh, a fan on a CPU, on a, on, a, on a processor, then this fan is forcing the air to move. And just imagine now you have the small rips and now the air will flow over the rips, heat up, and, the, and remove the heat together with the air stream. If we have natural convection, we basically don't have a fan and we also don't need a fan. Natural convection is only based uh, on the density change of uh, a heated air. So just imagine we have the same setup, again a processor, but no, not a, a, a fan. And as you know maybe, some smaller processors don't have a fan. And um, they still can be cooled based on natural convection. And natural convection is quite similar. The only difference is that the mass flux, so the, uh, the, ma the mass flux, the mass transportation of the fluid medium is not forced by an external fan or something like that, but uh, is uh, happening due to the density change. So uh, this is a most simple or most simplified phenomenon of convection, which doesn't need the external energy sources and uses a part of the energy, let's say, of the heat um, to have this net max flux, which is transporting energy and mass at the same time. And if we think about our 3D printer, there we have basic natural convection, natural convection is everywhere, but we can also have forced convection if we want, if we add a fan, for example. And now I would like directly to start with a live demo. And um, first of all, I see some questions, and so let me see if I can... Um, uh, answer some of them. Yes, the first question is by Youth, and he wants to know uh, what does Q represents on the last chart. Yes, and Q basically is the heat. So Q is used in physics and energy to describe heat. 
Then there's a question of uh, Debray. While doing the large thickness simulation, some extra surfaces are created in the model, like the cylindrical proportion of the nozzle is greater. Uh, so while assigning the contact surface boundary condition, do we have to consider those through the surfaces in horizontal plane or just the surface which are in direct contact? That's a very good question, Debra. And basically, uh, you need only to include surface which are in direct contact. However, uh, there is not every time only one right solution for contact definition. And there are a lot of possibilities uh, to model such a simulation using context on different way and will still give quite similar results. But uh, whenever the geometry massively change and let's say the topology of the contact change, you may have to rethink the contact, uh, contact definitions you're using right now. I hope that answered your question and if not, please feel also free to reach out to us using our forum there we will provide you with a uh, was quick and free support. Well then let's uh, continue and as I mentioned today we want to simulate the heat distribution inside this reduplicator. And therefore again we have prepared a nice CAD model. This is a simplified uh, mock-up of a, a RepRap 3D printer and we've added a housing around this printer. And now we want to simulate the heat transfer inside uh, the building domain of, of this printer. And first of all, uh, the big difference is last time we uh, investigated heat transfer inside solid bodies and this time we will do uh, the heat transfer inside uh, the fluid. So we will do a CFD simulation, a fluid flow simulation, which is considering convective heat transfer. And since it's natural convection and the flow speed is quite low, we can assume this simulation as completely laminar. A laminar in this context means, uh, as you all know, uh, flow can be turbulent, which usually uh, you can see in, in chaotic or fluctuating change of, of velocity, temperature and all the other uh, flow field quantities. But uh, for very slow changes and very low uh, flow velocities, we can use a laminar model. And uh, I think what is the most important here uh, is to choose the right boundary conditions. And that's what we want to do today. We will apply a kind of heat source on the nozzle where the filament is, is leaving. And there the temperature will be around 200 degree 503 Kelvin. Um, the hotbed will also uh, get a kind of, of, of hot surface boundary condition. Uh, there we will apply a temperature of 373 Kelvin. And for uh, the windows and walls, we will also use dedicated boundary conditions. So for the windows, which are from glass, we will use uh, adiabatic boundary conditions, condition, which means that there is no heat exchange between the windows and the outer environment, which is simplification, but we need it. And for the, uh, sorry, no, for the walls, we will use uh, adiabatic boundary condition, which means there is no heat exchange with environment. And for the windows, since the isolation of them is much lower, uh, we will use a symmetrical boundary condition with a fixed temperature of 293 Kelvin, which is around environment temperature. And now we will start to set up the simulation and therefore let's take a look at the CFD process. And um, first of all, uh, if you take a look, we have again the same three steps. We have again um, the pre-processing, the simulation design and the post-processing. And basically it's the same thing, but we are using different uh, uh, solvers since it's a difficult kind of physical phenomena and therefore some things are a little bit different. So let's a little bit talk about CFD. Uh, CFD uh, basically was invented like 200 years ago and back then several scientists independently uh, discovered uh, how momentum, mass and energy are distributed inside uh, a fluid flow. But back then and even today nobody is able to solve these analytic equations. 
And the only way is quite similar to FEA to divide your problem again into small subproblems and then use this simplified model to find an uh, approximate solution for the equation and to get approximate solution uh, for uh, the distribution of pressure, temperature and velocity inside this flow field. And the first step, again, we will uh, mesh the geometry, so we will divide it into uh, small tetraedas, uh, small hexaedas instead of tetraedas, what we did last time. And uh, like last time, we have to refine the mesh everywhere we expect higher changes. And after setting up the simulation, we can analyze the results and basically take a look at any flow variable wherever we want inside the flow field. Um, then there's a question by Madhu, and Madhu wants to know what CFD is. And that's a very good question. I saw maybe most of you know it already, but CFD stands for Computational Fluid Dynamics. So it's a kind of virtual wind tunnel. And just because a lot of people are confused, what's the difference between FEA and CFD? The difference is, first of all, the kind of equations I use to, to describe my problem. For CFD, I use Navier-Stokes equations. For FEA, I lose, use other conservation laws uh, for solid bodies. And also, because of the different name, uh, for FEA, it's, uh, I use uh, another kind of mathematical method to solve the equations and CFD, where I use the finite volume method, and that's the difference, basically. All right, then let's start to set up our simulation for today. Um, so I have prepared a project you can see here. And um, first of all, here you can see a geometry I have important, imported. And this is basically the geometry of our 3D printer. And you will say, ah, well, that looks strange. There's one thing you should not forget. Uh, we want to simulate the flow inside and not the, the solid material of the housing outside, which means that, first of all, we have to create a, a negative from our actual cap model. So what you can see here, like uh, this is like how the printer is looking inside. But basically, this cap model is describing the fluid domain and not the housing itself. So here you can see everything. And now we will start to prepare the mesh. And first of all, I will create a new mesh project based on this geometry. And now I will add a new mesh operation. And this time we will use hex dominant parametric meshing, which is only for CFD. And just after you select it, you will see that some, some um, settings will automatically be updated. And in contrast to um, the Tetrida mesh we used last time, uh, here the meshing process is based on a different approach. And what we're doing here basically is starting with a kind of background mesh, which is, which is then adapted on our geometry. And as you can see, this is like the bounding box of our background mesh. And if you click here, you can see the number of elements in each direction. So this is like kind of initial mesh we start with. And now we can define refinements to adapt this initial mesh size based on our needs. And before I actually, uh, yes, the first uh, refinement I will create is uh, a surface refinement. Let's call it surface ref. And this one will be applied on solid 0 and solid 2. So basically on everything which is inside. We will add a cell element level between 3 and 3, which means that all elements will be split at 3 times here. So we'll have a quite fine mesh for this red parts. And then finally, we have to add our selection from wheel, click on Save, and the mesh refinement was, is added. The next mesh refinement we need is for features, so for the edges of our model. And here, basically, we will just add a level of 4, Everything else can stay default, and edges will be detected based on an angle of larger than 150 degrees. 
Um, the next refinement we need is a kind of region refinement uh, around the extruder. And here, first of all, I will create a new geometry primitive, a cylinder. And uh, so I will define the cylinder by based on the reference point. Radius and the axis. So he will refine the mesh. Cell refinement level of two, and the final refinement is for the housing. So for solid one, and all our mesh refinements are applied. Finally, we have to change the number of processors we want to use in our case 32. Save and then we can start the meshing, which will take some time, maybe about 20 to 30 minutes. We have some questions I would like to answer right now. So the first question is by Omar. And he wants to know the difference between the finite element and the finite volume method. Omar, that's a very good, interesting question, but to answer it in detail will take a lot of time. Uh, therefore, let me try to simplify it. Um, basically, let's start with what they have in common. Both of them are methods, uh, use numerics to find an approximate solution for a complex differential equation. And uh, the, what another, um, and the difference between them are how they try or how they uh, apply the conservation uh, equations. A uh, finite finite element is like applying the loss on every node of the elements and then you get like for example for, for a stress simulation you get for every edge the displacement and the stress while CFD is based on the finite volume method where you only calculate um, what is happening inside uh, the whole element uh, uh, as, as one average value and the reason why you're using the different uh, methods is that uh, the find element method is more suited like for, for problems of structural mechanics, while the finite volume method is more stable for fluid flow problems. And there is a question which is very good by Bob Hurtline. If And he wants to know if there are any rules on how big the bounding box should be compared to the 3D printer box. Bob, very important, you have to rec uh, uh, recognize that here we are doing internal flow simulation. Therefore, later on, our bounding box will not have any effect. I will show you why. Um, this is our bounding box. We have only to make sure that it's larger than the internal volume we want to mesh. In the next step, we defined a so-called material point. And this material point defines later on what is inside and what is outside. As long as this point is inside uh, the model at a point where basically uh, you can find uh, volume. So then the mesh uh, will mesh only the internal part. But if you put it outside, you will get a, diff uh, a wrong mesh, which is considering only uh, the domain between the outer wall of the bounding box and the outer wall of 3D printer. Uh, when you do external flow simulation like a race car, then you have to make sure that uh, your bounding box is large enough and, and, not, and is avoiding any interaction with the model itself. Right, uh, now we are done, the meshing is taking place and since it's taken a little bit of time, I have already prepared uh, a mesh with exactly the same setting so that we can take a look at the final mesh. Okay, then let's wait. Sorry, it needs some time to load. It's a quite large mesh. Yes, and that's how the final mesh is looking like. And if we know, for example, and this can take some time, 
apply a mesh clip. Then you will see what I mean when I was talking about the internal fluid flow domain. So click on apply which will now uh, create a clip of the mesh. This can take some seconds, so in the meantime, let's do a quick wrap up of the mesh. So, what did I show you or I showed you not? First of all, the first step is to import a geometry. I skipped this as uh, a step uh, since I already showed it to you last time, but basically, you can upload this uh, CAD file uh, locally from your computer or, what, or do what we will do during uh, this session also uh, is using. Um, on shape direct import so it can directly import the model from our partner company on shape which is hosting a cloud-based CAD system. Just after that we have to define and create a hex dominant mesh. Hex dominant meshes are only suitable for CFD so you can use both types of mesh, TAT and hex meshes for CFD but only TAT meshes for FEA. And if you want to define a hex dominant mesh you first of all have to define a background bounding box uh, which is describing the initial mesh size and then you can define refinements based on, on edges, surfaces, volumes and regions to improve the quality of your mesh. And here again we're following the rule that uh, the mesh size should be uh, in accordance with um, the gradients uh, we expect. All right, now I hope Yes, the mesh clip is, is finished and now we can take a look inside the mesh. Wait, wrong direction. And as you can see, we mesh everything inside and the mesh uh, was uh, adapted and the near of edges and, and surfaces. The next step now is to actually set up the simulation itself. And therefore, uh, I will. I have already prepared a simulation, but I will create a new one to show you all the steps. First of all, we create a new simulation. Let's call it five millimeter demo. Click on create. And now, as you already know, first of all, you have to decide what you want to simulate. And last time, we did a thermostructural analysis of heat transfer. And this time we will do a fluid dynamic analysis of convective heat transfer. We will choose laminar turbulent steady state and turn the Bosinac approximation off. Because we don't want to approximate the changes, but we want to calculate them quite detailed because we expect to have high changes in temperature and density. Click on save and now your simulation tree will be prepared. And again, first of all, we have to choose the mesh we want to simulate. Click on Save to add the mesh. Now this is done. The mesh is loaded. And now we can start, first of all, to define the model. And since we are investigating natural convection, it's quite important for us to consider also gravitational effects. And first of all, we therefore have to add gravity in minus y direction, so minus 9.81 meter per uh, uh, second square. And the next step is to add the material for our simulation and we will again use our material library and import the material properties of air. This is done and now we can apply it on the whole, uh, full domain of our simulation. Again, the initial conditions uh, does not need to be modified. Uh, what we have to add now are boundary conditions and let's do it as we discussed it in the beginning of this webinar. So let's jump some slices back and start with the filament. And for the filament we will use a custom boundary condition where we will have no slip for velocity so that it will be treated as a physical wall 
with friction uh, or viscous effects between the wall and the flow. Um, the uh, pressure will be a fixed flux pressure and the temperature will add is 503 Kelvin. So let's switch and start with the filament. And I already prepared some so-called topological entity sets. Uh, I showed you last time how to create them and they are just a help. So let's now switch on custom. And then for velocity we have uh, no slip. For pressure we have fixed flux pressure, the temperature. is fixed value and the dynamic viscosity will be calculated. 503 Kelvin. Now we choose filament and click on save. And if we let me just hide the walls and the windows and then you will see the filament where it is. Let me also hide the hotbed. And now if we select the assignment Well, the next boundary condition we have to create is for the hot bed. It's basically the same boundary condition. Again, a custom boundary condition. With no slip. Fixed flux pressure a fixed value for the temperature and calculated density but here we'll use a different temperature here we'll use 373 we will apply it only on the hotbed click on save then the next two boundary condition is uh, that we need uh, are the windows and the walls so start let's start with the windows show again the full model and here we'll use um, again a custom boundary condition no slip for velocity and um, let me just check so again the pressure is fixed flux pressure temperature the fixed value and the viscosity is again calculated. And now we can also take a look on the faces where this boundary condition is applied. And finally we will add the boundary condition for the remaining walls. And here we will use the type, not custom, but wall. And this is no slip, temperature is zero gradient. And here we have to change from custom to wall. And now it's done. The only missing thing we have to modify are our numerics. So we will change this to 0 0.7. Relaxation factor is something like a stability factor. And as high as this factor is, as faster your simulation will be computed, as more instable it can become. And so we reduce it from 1 to 0 0.7 to make the uh, calculation of density more accurate and more stable.
and we will change the solver from PCG to GAMG. Well, and now we are basically done. The only thing we have to modify is uh, our simulation, so we will start with uh, 2500 iteration, as you know from last time, like FEA, CFD is based on an iterative approach. We will change the time lapse length to 1, use 16 cores, modify the maximum runtime by factor 10. And now we are done, we can click on save, and if we want, we can start the simulation. So let's again do a quick wrap up. So what I did, I showed you right now. First of all, how to set up the general uh, simulation setup, like choosing fluid dynamic simulation, convective heat transfer, and I think the most two important decisions in this special case are to use laminar flow and to turn off buoyancy approximation, since we need more accuracy. Approximation is not accurate enough. Next step is to assign a mesh, define material and physical properties like uh, gravity, and then basically to define the boundary condition. And if we want to modify the physics of the simulation, we can now just, for example, modify a boundary condition. If we want to test different uh, heat bed temperatures and which influence they have on the total uh, heat, uh, heat distribution inside the printer, we can just modify and play around with the uh, temperature boundary condition of the of the heat bed. Two things I want, don't want to talk about uh, in detail are numerical solver settings and advanced solver controls. We just modified some solver settings uh, like the relaxation factor and also the solver used for, for pressure calculation. Um, and But basically most of the cases should stick to the default values uh, on projects which you find at the library. Uh, since playing around with the settings uh, requires some experience. Right, and before we resume, there are some questions I would like to answer. So, uh, especially one question by Jose. And Jose wants to know what are the big differences in precision between some scale simulations and other tools like Annex, Siemens, and the sort of Star CCM. Jose, that's a very good question. And uh, I think uh, to, uh, to understand what we are doing, you should know that our simulation tools in the background are based on open source software, which we modify. And for example, for CFD simulations, we use OpenFoam, which is a quite famous open source framework. It comes without any GUI and is not very user friendly, but the solver itself is very good. And therefore, I don't think that there are major differences in terms of quality results. Uh, between SimScale and other CFD tools, but uh, I think the best is to try it yourself. If you have a result which is validated, uh, you can just try it on your own. And we also have on SimScale.com a validation library. Let's show it to you, and maybe it will help. So let's go on SimScale.com. And there we have, under our documentation, and here you will find our documentation, here. And there we also have a validation library which you, I think, will find here, exactly. And there, you can just check yourself the accuracy of our tools. Great, then I hope uh, this answered your question, and then I think we can, uh, yes, uh, take a look at the post-processing. So the simulation will take some time, and therefore I've prepared the simulation. And the simulation itself takes, uh, yes, approximately five hours. And once the simulation is finished, you will receive such a plot. And this plot shows the accuracy of your simulation. So on the x-axis, we have the iterations, and on the y-axis, we have the, uh, the residual, so the average error for each flow quantity. As you can see, for all quantities, independent uh, if we talk about pressure or velocity or enthalpy, 
uh, the error is changing and becoming sta uh, stable after a bunch of iterations. And now we can take a look at the three-dimensional results. And therefore, let's take a look at the solution fields. It can take some seconds to, to load this large uh, result field. So if you have questions, just drop them right now. By the way, just because I'm interested, maybe everybody can raise his hand who already started to work on the homework. Oh, I see some hands right now. Great. And what's about the others? There's still enough time and I really would appreciate to see as, long, as much homework assignments as possible. Okay, and now um, I think uh, the simulation result was loaded and that is our final, our simulation result. And first of all, we have to jump to the final time step. Just a second. Oh, sorry, I think I have to reload the page. Something went wrong. And you can click on this button if you want to restart the post processor. Ahmed wants to know from where he will get the geometry and the assignment. Dear Ahmed, like last week, we will send out tomorrow a link including a step-by-step -step, uh, tutorial for this homework and um, also a link where you will find a parametric model of the geometry and where you can even adapt and customize this model for your own simulation. Uh, just be patient for one more day. Okay, I just restarted the post processor. That can happen sometimes, especially if uh, you have not cleared your cache for a very long time. And now you can see the simulation result was loaded into the 3D browser. So let's switch to full screen. And now we jump to the final um, time step. And what we can see here right now is the um, pressure, I think. Just wait a second until it's uh, finally loaded. And what we can already do is um, to take a look inside the fluid domain. Sorry, one last try. No, it should work. And now a last try. Now I click on solution field and now everything should load quickly.
Okay, and I think no, it's loading finally, so I just had to restart my web browser. Maybe first of all, let's take a look at some results, which I have already prepared. So, um, here you can see some results I have processed before. And the only difference between the three geometries or the three simulation is uh, the distance um, between the extruder and the ground plate between the uh, a filament, uh, between the heat bed. We are changing the distance from 1 to 5 up to 10 millimeters. And what we can see here right now is the heat distribution inside. And you can see we have a temperature range between 290 and 380 degree Celsius. And you can exactly see like how this distance is changing the overall flow field. And if you want to take a look in detail, uh, let's go like this. So we start with the one millimeter gap between um, the bed and the extruder and here you can see the temperature distribution where red is to, uh, representing a hot temperature while blue is representing a low temperature. You can see that if you have this low distance basically you have uh, a very thin boundary layer between the temperatures and uh, like a hot spot here. So this is a very very low uh, gap, very small gap and this results in a kind of hot spot here, which will definitely lead to wrapping. Increasing this distance changes the whole temperature field, and this hot spot becomes much smaller here, and in return, the overall temperature uh, above the seat bed in the whole domain rises a little bit. You can see it on the color. Here everything is quite dark blue, while here it's very light blue, nearly green already. And if we further increase the distance, the temperature drops again. And as we can see here, I think that's a very good insight for, for um, a, which shows what CFD is able to deliver. So using the simulation now, we can ki kind of optimize this hot green area around the extruder. And in the best case, all the part should be inside this green bubble. And now we can use simulation to optimize, for example, the distance between the extruder and, and the heat bed, but also to optimize, for example, the temperature or the size of the heat bed. And now you can see some more details of the results. Now we have plotted the temperature distribution for all three cases, where red is one millimeter distance, yellow is 5 millimeter distance and green is 10 millimeter distance um, of the extruder. And now we plot the temperature distribution along this red line. And as you can see, if we have 1 millimeter distance, you will have this hot spot which is rapidly dropping. And then for, and, and once you know this hot spot is, is falling below the green and yellow chart, it stays below them for nearly all the time. And if you increase, you can see, as it's uh, the distance, that we get a much smoother temperature field uh, inside this bed. And um, it shows clearly that the distance of 10 millimeters creates a better profile in the near of the heat bed, which is more homogene. And we can do the same for the other direction. And if you take a look at the structure of the graphs, it's still looking quite similar. Um, here we have another flow topology uh, because the flow here is rotating like that, unlike the flow here which is rotating like that. And therefore we have again this hot spot for one millimeter distance. And again, if we use 10 millimeter distance, we get the smoothest distribution of the temperature. Yes, and that is exactly what your homework is about. By the way, now the post processor loaded everything and what we see first is a blue box because now we are visualizing the velocity which is zero at all the walls. 
but we can change the quantity we are visualizing from velocity pressure for example and then take also a look inside this part using slices etc. But now let's talk about your homework assignment. Uh, your homework assignment is to cre uh, uh, create exactly the same simulation we will therefore again provide you with a parametric on shape model where you can change with one click the distance between the extruder and the bed and your job is to create a simulation at least for two different extruder positions. Don't worry, you basically just have to set up one time and then you can copy the mesh and, and, and simulation setup, replace the geometry and the mesh and it should not take more than one hour. And again, we will provide you with a step-by-step -step tutorial and the recording of the session on simscale.com slash 3D printing workshop. Uh, you will find everything there from tomorrow uh, afternoon and also, and I will also send you an email including all the details and resources. And now I think we have uh, some time left for the Q&A, so whenever you have questions, just write them and I will try to answer everything. So the first question is by Florian Runinger. I'm not sure if I got that right. Are the frames and the glass window also stated as made of air as the volume the took was also meshed? Is there a significant error induced in that heat conducted th through is not taken into account? Independent question, is there some kind of rule of thumb for the maximum temperature gradient that is acceptable for this application? Hey, Florian, first of all, uh, thank you very much for your question. And uh, regarding the first aspect, um, we are not assuming that the air, uh, that the wall and the uh, or the frame and the glass is made from, from, from any material. Basically, we are only simulating the lasted layer of air before touching the wall of uh, the glass and the frame. And that's the reason why we use air for everything, since we are only simulating the air inside and not what is happening in interaction with the frame or the glass. And regarding a second question, uh, there is not really a, a, a rule of thumb, I think. Uh, and the maximal temperature gradient really depends on uh, the kind of extruder you're using, and especially on the material, if you use ABS or PLA. Ahmed wants to know if he have not uh, he has not submitted the first assignment, and if I if if it's enough to just submit the second one. Unfortunately, Ahmed, um, for getting the certification, you do have to submit all three assignments. If uh, you have don't have the time this week to finish both of them, reach out to me and we'll find a solution. All right, seems that all the other questions were answered uh, by my colleague Krishna. Uh, oh, well, one more question by Miles, and he wants to know on the last two graphs where those temperature was x-axis or y-axis. Uh, yes, that depends. Um, uh, one of them is in x-direction, and the other one is in that direction. And y-direction, in this case, is up and down, by the way. All right. Okay, then. Thank you very much for joining. Hope to see you also see you also next week. Stay tuned and work on the homework. Uh, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. See you soon. Bye.